I'm Greg Rockefeller. I'm Beth Rockefeller. And I'm Mia Rockefeller. And this is Reading with the Rockefellers, a family book club podcast. Today, we are discussing Red Queen by Victoria Aviard. So grab a copy and join us on this literary journey. Mare Barrow's world is divided by blood, those with red and those with silver. Mare and her family are lowly reds, destined to serve the silver elite, whose supernatural ability make them nearly gods. Mare steals what she can to help her family survive, but when her best friend is conscripted into the army, she gambles everything to win his freedom. A twist of fate leads her to the royal palace itself, where, in front of the king and all of his nobles, she discovers a power of her own, an ability she didn't know she had, except her blood is red. To hide this impossibility, the king forces her into a, the role of a lost silver princess and betroths her to one of his sons. As Mare is drawn further into the silver world, she risks her new position to aid the Scarlet Guard, the leaders of a Red Rebellion. Her actions put into motion a deadly and violent dance, pitting prince against prince and Mare against her own heart. From debut author Victoria Aviard comes a lush, vivid fantasy series where loyalty and desire can tear you apart, and the only certainty is betrayal. Welcome to Reading with the Rockefellers. This is Red Queen, chapters one and two. Okay, so Mare seems to be the key word in that description of the book. That's our main character, Mm -hmm. our protagonist, Mare. Um, Tell us a little bit about the main character because you want to kind of go into this because the very first line of the book starts right out from her point of view and everything's from her point of view, right? Yeah. So, uh, the main character is Mara Barrow and she is, as the description said, um, a very low in the general ranks of society and she, the entire book is from her point of view and most of the series is from her point of view. But, um, so everything, all the information that you get is the information she gets, and your opinion is kind of swayed by her opinion because of how the book is written. Okay. Um, I think before we really get into the the chapter, the first chapter in the very beginning, we want to talk about um, the blood divide, the red versus the silver. That's a key thing that we really need to get into for people to understand, I think. Yeah, it's, uh... As described, there are reds and silvers. Reds are the low. The highest that reds usually get is, like, merchants that make decent money. And the silvers are the elite. They're the, the royals, the monarchs. And uh, they are just better than the reds in this hierarchy because of these superhuman abilities that they possess. And there's a wide range of abilities. Everything from, you know, things that don't seem that big of a deal to something insanely powerful that nobody should be able to do. And the silvers are basically have everything. Yeah. And the reds are normal people like you and me that have nothing. They're basically the yeah. servant class. It's, it, you can kind of think about it in, like, as the difference between, uh, like, in the Hunger Games, as the difference between the capital and the districts. It's similar to that. Okay. And the difference here with Mare and the silvers that you, you know, a lot of silvers that you see is, like, the difference between the capital and, like, District 12. Right. And they're <laughs> it's almost... a huge difference. I, I know in the, the first chapter, they're almost described sort of like as gods among men they almost describe them in this way like i think that uh, maybe like the greek or uh, would describe the gods that they believed in back in the day where they thought that they were actual gods but they're actually walking amongst people yeah in this and it's almost like they're living in an age yeah of gods there, there's amongst humans there's that's, actual, the way they, that's the way they're almost described yeah there's an actual quote that is um that talks about, you know, angels and gods that lived in the sky and that they were kind. And it says that um, the gods still rule. They've just come to Earth and they're the silvers and they're no longer kind. That's a good description. Yeah. I like that. Okay. 
let's go ahead and start from Ware's point of view. Let's get that first line okay. out because it kind of sets the tone for everything. The very first line is, I hate First Friday. So clearly, Mayor does not like whatever First Friday is. So what is First Friday? First Friday is a competition in an arena that Reds are all forced to watch between two silvers, and they just show off their abilities, beat each other down for a little bit, and by the time someone gets injured, they stop the fight because no one is supposed to die. It's... <laughs> It really is kind of like gladiatorial combat, but it's yeah. almost like prof today's professional wrestling mixed with gladiatorial combat. Because they hurt mm -hmm. each other, but they have these healers who can heal them. Yeah. So it really is about a show of power. Yeah. It's the American kind of, Gladiators. It is, yeah. It's, exactly. It's a lot like American Gladiators. It's just a big show. Yeah. No, no if one, they were X-Men. There's never, there's never like any permanent damage or anything, and no one really dies. Right. In these battles. Uh, for the most part. There, yeah, that's, that's the point. The point of it is really to show their power to the Reds. Yeah. To the normal people. When we say Reds, we mean they're just basically like you and me, yeah. normal human beings. The Silvers are, I mean, yeah, the high ups, the gods on Earth or whatever they are. Yeah. Um, so everybody crams into like an arena yes. to watch this battle between the Silvers. Mm -hmm. And we meet the first two Silvers. Yes. And they have specific abilities. So tell us about the two abilities that were introduced to in the first first Friday battle. The two first abilities that were kind of introduced to are very different. Uh, one of them is a strong arm who just has superhuman strength. In every way, they're stronger than any normal person. And um, so, you know, they can beat a person up. It's, it goes a lot beyond that, but that's all it's really shown for in here. And the other is a Whisper, which are very rare and dangerous and feared, even amongst Silvers. Other Silvers don't really like these people. Why is it, what, what do Whispers do? Whispers uh, have the ability to get into someone's mind, so they can read your mind, they can control someone's mind, and they can change someone's mind uh, if they're powerful enough they can basically completely change a person. That's insane. So you think, wow, you've got a guy who's like strong like the Incredible Hulk, he's going to be impossible to beat, but then you got a guy who doesn't need to use his muscles at all because you can, he can control your yeah. mind. So this battle rages on. Who ends up, who is the winner of this battle? The Whisper winds up winning this battle. And the, the abilities are important because there's, Really, it's the kind of the families, right, that have, the, yeah. the whole family has the same ability. That's what they are. Yeah. And it's kind of how they're divided in houses. So you have some abilities which are super powerful. With the Silvers, we find out real quick it's all about displays of power. That's mm -hmm. how they live their lives. Yeah, and it's really shown how the loyalty to families comes from your ability, where if you have a... You have an ability that's not like from your family like say you got it from you know your mom or whatever um you can be exiled from that family because you do not share that ability wow wow so that's a big deal and when silvers marry they don't take their the woman does not take their husband's last name so that they stay considered loyal to their family wow that's impressive so then if two silvers marry and they both have separate types of powers and they have children, is it like puppies with two different color dogs where some come out one color and some come out the other color? Yes, it's, it's usually like that. There is a very rare situation where they will um, mix to make a very special new ability, but it hasn't happened in centuries so you'll either get your mother's ability or your father's ability correct gotcha okay so we finished with the first friday battle and we as we're going into the friday battle we need to she, she there's another character we need yes 
Uh, the ghost so, to the Friday battle with her, correct? Yes. The first Friday with her. Um, so the other character that you meet, his name is Kalorn, and he's been Mare's friend for quite a while. Um, and they're both teenagers, right? Yes, Basically. they're both teenagers. Like 17? Mare's 17. 17. Mare is 17 and Kalorn is 18. Okay. And um, Kalorn has a job as a fisherman's apprentice, so he is safe from everything in the grand scheme of things he has a job the big so one being conscription money. which we yes, will get into which we will get into and uh he are galore and his mayor's basically best friend they're, yes they're pretty tight yeah as friends go she, he's really the only friend that she has outside of her family and they're at this battle yes and then so we see them um spectate the battle mm -hmm. and the battle ends yes and then we move on to the next, like, I guess, big thing that the next thing that's kind of talked about is conscription, which is a thing we need to get to. Yeah, because we're, we're taking people to war, but let's talk about the war that's being fought a little bit. So this war is a war between um, the country that, uh, you know, Mare is in and the country that her family lives in. And, uh, which is called Norda, and the country to the north, which is the Lakelands. The battle's been going on for a century, and no one even really remembers why it started. They just know that it's still going. And ultimately, it's really a battle between silvers. They just use the reds. Yes. It's as to their, fight their battles their for them. Armies. It's a yeah. battle between the two silver kingdoms. They're just using the reds to fight it because Correct. they don't care about red lives at this point. Correct. And conscription is the what actually happens. What is the conscription process like? And what would be like a seventeen-year-old like Mayor looking at um, in her near future? So, when conscription is uh, when someone turns eighteen, if they do not have a job or an apprenticeship they are conscripted into the army. So they are forced into the army and forced to go to war. Right. And it's in this world, it's not like you can just go to the Foot Locker and get a job as a shoe salesman and decide you have a yeah. job. It's got to be, they're talking about what the Silvers call essentials. Really, yes. the only jobs available are things making what Silvers want or serving, waiting on Silvers or getting yeah. things that Silvers want. Otherwise, you're not useful to them unless you're in the war. Right. So, Kalorn, he said, is an apprentice to a fisherman, which mm -hmm. means he's oh, he's right now okay because he's learning a trade that would be considered essential. Yes. Mare, on the other hand, what does she do? She doesn't have a job. She doesn't she, have skills that they consider essential. Yeah, she doesn't have a job. She doesn't have any talent that they would consider essential that the Silvers would have any use for. So, most of what she spends her days doing is pickpocketing people on the streets. She's a thief to support, to support her, family. her family because it's the only thing she can do. And it's the only way she can save to get anything for her family when she's conscripted. She sees no way out of it. It's She just accepted that she's going to go to war. Because she has nothing correct. Um, so, do they... They view conscription clearly, I mean, because it's basically like the draft that mm -hmm. we, we know of that has happened before in, in this country. Um, except way harder to dodge. Ex right, except it's basically everyone. When you turn 18, you go, yeah. unless you have something that the ruling class deems is worthy of them saving you because you can make something for them. Yeah. So it's a, they're, they're in a pretty bad place. Mm -hmm. As far as Mare and Kalorn, and they may have different opinions or varying opinions... How do they view the Silvers? They both view them similarly as having these abilities that, you know, they'll never be able to have. And being able to kind of marvel at those abilities and be like, whoa, that's, you know, that's cool. But um, they do see them as the people that are keeping them in the place they are now. Very low and you know, having to fight and steal for food. So so they're seeing the this situation for what it really is, if we'll be honest. Yes. That the Silvers are 
basically enslaving the Reds. You either do this, or you go to war. I mean, there's no mm -hmm. real, there's no real alternative. So yeah. they're basically slaves to the Silvers. Most people, Marin Kalorn, are people they see this. Do most Reds realize this, or are there Reds that fit that, that thing? Because it's been this way for centuries. Yeah. Is it? Do, there, are, there are a lot of Reds that, that are like this is just the way it is. They're the gods, and they. There's a group of Reds that kind of see it that way, correct? Yeah, most most people see it. Most people either see it as like, well, this is just how it is. Well, I mean, like, they're they're just gods. There's nothing we There's can do. There's nothing we can do, and um, some people also see it as like, yeah, this is wrong. This clearly isn't good. But what can we do? Like. Some people don't say this is how it should be, or this is how it's always been, so this is how it's supposed to be, but they don't know how they can change it. Correct. Okay. Okay, so um, we've gotten through the first Friday, and they're, we know what conscription is. They're going mm -hmm. this war. We've kind of gone over the red and the silver, the blood divide, and our uh, divide, and our two major characters. We've gone through that. Um, that and, pretty much rounds out chapter one, I think, right? That is mostly uh, chapter one. Chapter 1 really ends with the first Friday battle, which we already covered. Okay. All right. Um, before we move on to the second chapter, just from a char from character point of view, what, after what we briefly know, are first impressions from all of us on the characters? We'll start with Mayor. What's like your first impression of Mayor? Um, I personally uh, like Mayor. I get that you're supposed to because she's the... You know, she's the narrator. Everything is from her point of view. And it's early on. We don't have a ton to go with. But yeah. yeah. And it's very early. But, um, yes, she steals. But, A, she's not the only one that does that. A lot of people, a lot of Reds do that in these poor villages because they have to, to make any semblance of money. Right. And, um... Also, she's doing, I mean, she's doing it to support her family. It's not anything selfish. She's just, she's supporting her mom, dad, and her little sister. Yeah, well, good. Good evening. Any, any other, any other opinions on Mayor? You have a differing opinion? I think that pretty much sums up how I felt, too. Um, you're supposed to kind of feel sorry for the path that she's had to choose in this young in life. Yeah, like she's only 17 and she's already making her money by robbing other people, basically. Yeah, I mean, she's doing something illegal. On the flip side, um, very early on, you're... Uh, they identify Mare as um, very crafty. Um, very quick on her feet and able to adapt to a lot of different situations. So yes. you start seeing from pretty early on in the book that she's going to have these qualities that make her different than just your average red that's kind of beaten down and, you know, ready to settle into right. this yeah. silver run life. Mare is kind of always she's looking for a way around that. Uh, a good way to describe her is very agile and quick-witted. Yeah. Quick on her feet, mm -hmm. both literally and figuratively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that um, that's a great description uh, as far as her. Because she sees the world, and we haven't got quite that past that in the first chapter yet, but she sees kind of reds that have some kind of talent that the Silver Sea is um, essential as the ones who were smart, and she's got nothing to give anybody. When mm -hmm. real reality, in this world, she doesn't specifically, but with the attributes she has, she, she, like you said, she's very quick-witted. She's able to come up with things really um, quickly, you discover, as the character moves on. And I think that makes her perfect and gives her the talent she needs for what going to happen to her later in the book and she does the author does a good job of kind of showing you the ability the talents that she does have that she doesn't realize she has that are going to make her yeah. getting by and staying alive through what comes 
it's going to make it possible because of the ability she does have. Yeah. There's other abilities she has that we haven't found out about yet. Yeah, she's... Um, a lot of people wouldn't be able to make it through what she winds up going through. And right. it's just because of her, Very, it, it, because of everything she can do, you know, her... She's much more mentally tough than she gives herself credit yeah, for. Yeah, she, and then a lot of people give her credit for, because they just see a 17-year-old girl and don't think she can have that kind of, you know, and she doesn't think that she can have that kind of toughness and that mental ability to handle things like she does. Um, Kalorn. <laughs> Excuse me. Any, 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 um, first thoughts on Kalorn? Um, well, the, the first thought that I personally got of Kalorn was, this dude's a little bit of a jerk. Like, just a little bit. It's like the joking around kind of jerk. He, he get, I got the immediate impression that he's kind of jerky towards her sometimes. But because, in a joking way. Well, yeah, because he's got a thing for her. It's like real clear it's the guy that's kind of oh, yeah. poking the girl and picking on the girl because mm -hmm. he likes her. That's, that's it's the, the first, I like her and I don't know what to do about it. That's the first impression I got from Kaloran immediately. Yeah. This is a way I can get attention yes. from her yeah. because he knows how to get her goat really and she's, easily. Because they spent so long together. She's yeah. air quotes annoyed with him but she's <laughs> not really because she likes the attention. Yeah. And uh, he's he does have a job, but he does steal with Mare sometimes because he gets the extra money to help not only himself but her because he doesn't have much of a family anymore. Tell us what that means, much of a family anymore. Well, um, his uh, father was uh, obviously uh, conscripted and didn't wind up coming back alive. So he died in the war. And his mom, after uh, he was born and after his dad died, uh, disowned him, basically. She just ran off. And so he uh, grew up from a young age not having parents. And that's when he and Mare really started bonding because he didn't have a family and she could kind of take care of him because she had been taking care of her family. So he is more a part of her family than anything else. Okay. So we've got a pretty good grasp on, I think, the first, our main characters here that we've met. Mayor is clearly the protagonist. It's all the books from her point of view. We've got Kalorn. We know what First Friday is. We've got an understanding of the Reds and the Silvers. We've gone over conscription. These are all kind of key things that... Yeah really play throughout the book. Is there anything else we need to go over from the first chapter before we move on? Um, not that I can think of. We've gone over the abilities we've already seen. Um, the, uh, the town, the village that they live in, um, is a very small village, um, and everyone that lives there is poor. And all the houses there are very do, tiny. Do they give the, the stuff? Do they call it, the name it and give a description of the of it in this chapter or um, in the second chapter? That they do it's that? it's in the the first chapter when they have like a basic description. Um, everyone that lives there calls it the stilts because all of the houses are built on stilts because in uh, when it gets wet in like the rainy season. The river rises. They're basically living a floodplain. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so they're all still houses. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we got an idea of, of where they live. Now, do we want to move on to the second chapter and get an idea? Because this is where we get to Mayor's house. Yes. Yeah, let's take family. a little break, and then we'll hit the second chapter. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's move on to chapter two now. Mm -hmm. um, th this chapter, we're going to get to Mayor's house, which we, mm -hmm. we discussed was the stilts. We went into that a little yeah. bit. We'll get, and we'll get to meet... Um, I guess part of, of Mare's family, so. Yes. So, um, in the very beginning of the chapter, she describes her house as being small, even by stilt standards. So her house is very tiny, uh, and that's saying something in such a small village where all the houses are very small. She's poor amongst poor people. Yes. Uh, and um, her entire family, which... At this point, is only um, four people, but she does have more siblings. Uh, it's living in this house. 
So how many total barrows are there? There are a total of seven. Uh, their mother and father and five children. Okay, and currently living at home is only the youngest two, yes. Mare and her little sister Giza. Yes. So, um, Mare obviously, um, is, and is there not there? So, who's living in the house right now? Um, Mare, her little sister Giza, and our mom and dad. Okay, the dad is there now. Yes. Okay. Okay, go ahead, sorry. So, um, Mare is the kind of the one that takes care of the entire family because, um, Giza has a job, so she does make money, but she's not there very often. Um, their mom is, she's, I mean, she's getting older, and it, she's, it's harder for her to do things, and so she's, um... She basically just stays home and takes care of the house and takes care of their dad, who was injured in the war. He barely came home alive. So he was conscripted. Yes. And he's, he's in a wheelchair when we first yeah. uh, meet the Barrow so he's family. In, uh, he's, yeah. he's, he's basically he's handicapped at this point, mm -hmm. not really able to contribute and work. Yeah, he's missing a leg and a lung. So. Ooh. And the only he got one, beat up so, pretty bad. Yeah, the only one working is Giza. Yes. Giza has a job as a seamstress slash embroiderer. Yeah. And she seems to have, she seems to be good at it. She's very good at right. it. Yeah, yes. she makes um, the dresses for mm -hmm. Silver. uh, Silver's royalty and non-royalty. Yes. So Giza has a very... Um, as far as reds go, a pretty bright high, future. Uh, yeah, yeah, very high level job, very bright future, a skill mm -hmm. that is in high demand. Yeah, and one thing to point out is um, she was actually not forced to watch First Friday because she was working. Uh, she was in a completely different town working. And then think about that. As important as First Fridays are for sh display of power amongst the Silvers, she gets off because she's such a good seamstress, and that's one of the things that the Silvers, not only are they godlike with their abilities, but they dress the part. Very opulent in everything. Yeah. Their buildings, their dress and everything, and Giza's able to make those things that the Silvers love so much as far as their dresses and the ornate things that they wear, and that's big to them, so big that... She doesn't have to go to war because mm -hmm. she can make really awesome clothes. Yeah. For basically. Silvers, it's all about appearance. So, Obviously, right. they are very powerful, but the more powerful they appear to Reds, the more powerful that right. the Reds will think they are. Just, just to emphasize, that's just, well, yeah, exactly. That's just to emphasize how important of a talent Giza has. It's, yeah. She really could be the one that pulls the family out of yeah. where they're at right now, as far as Reds go. Okay. Mm -hmm. And tell us about where Giza is at while Mare is at First Friday. Um, she is working in a city that's actually not far. Um, it's across the Capital River, which is the big river that runs through the entire country. Um, so it's basically just across the river and downriver a little bit. What's the name of the city? Uh, this city is called Somerton. Okay. And it's called Somerton... Because it is where the royals go in the summer. It has their summer palace, and it's just where they go every summer. So basically, um, the jobs follow the royal family. Yes. Wherever the money goes, the jobs go with them. So you, if they travel, you have to travel to keep up with exactly. the pack. Gotcha. So um, we get to uh, the Barrow's house. Mm-hmm. And we meet. One thing I do want to say before that, um, before Mare actually goes inside, she sees uh, the Silvers going to Somerton, the last of like the Silvers that still need to go there, uh, traveling along the Capital River from the Capital down to Somerton. So we get kind of a little description of how they're traveling how are these particular silvers traveling it's it's like a cruise like you know a yacht very classy and um they have the flags with their house colors on them 
so that everyone knows which family that is that's going on that boat in particular. Swanky. Very swanky. Um, okay, so we, we, uh, we, we meet the barrels now. Yes. So when she goes inside the house, um, the, the first thing is her mom is working on dinner for them. Uh, Giza is embroidering, which she spends literally all of her time doing because it's her job. And she makes killer she money. She makes killer money doing it. And, um, as always, their father is sitting in his wheelchair. As kind of a placeholder, um, where, how old is Giza in, uh, relative to Mare? She is, um, 14, almost 15 years old. Okay, so about two and a half years younger. Gotcha. Yeah, all of the Barrow children are about two, two and a half years apart. Okay, so we meet mom, dad, Giza. Mm -hmm. And, um, Kalorn goes with Mare to the house. Uh, he does not. I don't remember what he was doing. Uh, he was going, so I think he was actually going to work. Because he didn't have to because of First Friday, but he did after uh, the feed ended. Ah, yeah, and he's got to go. So what happens when we see, when we meet the Barrows? Um, there is a, you know, a conversation about how, um, her mom, their mom doesn't really... She appreciates what Mare does and appreciates that she's trying to provide for the family, but just wishes she could do it in a less illegal way, like Giza. And it's, she doesn't ever want to say that she just wishes Mare was more like Giza, but that's exactly what she means. And everyone knows it. It, it right, because Mare doesn't have a talent that, that the Silvers would consider essential. Mm hmm and her mom almost holds that against her. Yeah. You know, it's we, we're, we're meeting the family, and I kind of jot some things, a couple of notes down when we start to talk about the fam, her family, so I could, mm -hmm. you know, some points. And I have a lot of notes about all the characters, but when I got to her mom, first of all, I, I wrote, not sure what her name is, and kind of a milk toast. Like, <laughs> there's not her a Her name is Ruth, by the way. Ruth, that okay, helps. good. But, yeah, Ruth Barrow. But to me, yeah. she's, uh, it's not that she's not a defined character, I mean, it's not that there's not effort put into the character, I'm not saying that at all, but I feel like she's beaten down so much yeah. so that there's, she, she's almost like robotic and that she go the way yeah. she goes through life just because this is how life is supposed exactly. to be. Exactly. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it specifically says, uh that these fights about, you know, what Mare does and how she gets everything she gets to provide for the family, like, fights about that are so common that they happen at least once a day. Yeah. So, that's just, it's like, she's so used to getting berated by her mom about that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. life's pretty bleak in the stilts. Yeah, and her mom's just kind of... I don't know. She just is living the life she's been dealt. Right. Yeah. Disabled husband. Yeah. Sons at war. Right. Only one income, legal income. Legal in income the house. source. The other income source they need, but she doesn't approve of it, but there's nothing she can do. They need the money. Yeah. Right. And she's not so. going to change who Mare is. Well, and, I mean, because she, no one can she, do that. Does her mom work? No. No. So, I mean, put up or shut up. <laughs> I, no, but really, I mean, you know, Mayor's doing what she can do, what she's yeah. capable of doing. It's just, they're in, a, they're in a bad situation. I think you get an idea that it's a family that cares about each other, but they're in a bleak situation, but they're always all in a bleak situation, so mm -hmm. it's just life yeah. to them. Yeah. So, that's, that's a, they, they do a good job of kind of building that and letting you know where Reds, where normal people stand mm -hmm. in this world. <clears throat> So. And then speaking of brothers at war, we get some information about one of Mare's brothers. Oh, um, yeah. So Mare has three older brothers. Do they go into them all three in this chapter? Um, 
Yes, you hear uh, like all three of their names, and okay, um, so give us all three of their names, because again, I wrote the notes down for for this. I was trying to crack my head, like I said, I didn't remember her mom's name. And for her brothers, they're Shade. Everyone remembers Shade. We, we people will we'll know. We'll get you Shade, yeah. And mm -hmm. her other two brothers are mentioned multiple times in the books, but I can't remember their names. So to me, they're just always Buford and Numb Nuts. <laughs> That's what I literally wrote down. I, and all I wrote down as a description is they're big old boys, but not bright. <laughs> not really. That's not my bright. discussion. I mean, I know their names are Bree and Tramie mm -hmm. now, yeah. but that's just that's my first impressions because they talk about them here, hither and yonder. Mm -hmm. um, and I, half the time I forget they exist. But so, what do we hear about the brothers or uh, uh, in this chapter? Yeah. So um, Bree is the oldest. He's like he's like um in his 20s like early 20s um mid 20s and uh he's you know he and Tramie are very similar who's the middle brother um uh he they're both very big like i mean like you said they're large and they're strong but they are not very smart the uh the younger Three barrows have always been the smarter ones. They got the brains in the family. A little more crafty. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so Shade is the only one that can really write, uh, very well. So he's the one sending all the letters to the family while he's at war. And, uh, you actually get one of his letters in this chapter. And, uh, they read it around the dinner table. Okay. Okay, you want to read it for us? Um, so the opening of the letter, which is how he starts all of his letters, is, Dear family, I'm alive, obviously. Uh, bonus points for Shade. <laughs> Shade always gets those bonus points. Um, and uh, the rest of the letter goes, We've been called away from the front, as Dad the Bloodhound has probably guessed because his dad sniffed, their dad sniffed the letter and was like, oh yeah, this doesn't smell like smoke. They're not at the war front. Super sniffer. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's nice getting back to the main camps. It's red as the dawn up here. You can barely see the silver officers. And without the choke smoke, you can actually see the sunrise stronger every day. But I won't be in for long. Command plans to repurpose this unit for Lake Command, and we've been assigned to one of the new warships. I met a medic detached from her unit who said she knew Tramie and that he's fine. Took a bit of shrapnel retreating from the choke, but he recovered nicely. No infection, no permanent damage. Still nothing about Bree, but I'm not worried. He's the best of us. And he's coming up on his five-year leave. He'll be home soon, Mom, so stop your worrying. Nothing else to report. At least I can write, at least that I can write in a letter. Giza, don't be such a show-off, even though you deserve to be. Mare, don't be such a brat all the time and stop beating up that Warren boy. Dad, I'm proud of you. Always. Love all of you. Your favorite son and brother, Shade. So, clearly he knows the family very well, but even though he hasn't been there for the past, like, year, he still knows exactly what's going on. And you really kind of get a lot, that little bit, you get a lot about this character you don't, you haven't even met. Yeah just from the little bit that he wrote, what kind of personality he has in the middle of this war. He's still playful with yeah. his family, still cares about his family. He has a family, very snarky personality. Always hopeful. Always, you know what I mean? Seems like yeah. he's on the, thinks things on the bright side. One thing I want to bring up about this letter, and it's one of those things, I guess, if you're listening, you write it down, because I'm writing it down. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're reading along with us as we go, reading a chapter, then listening, write this down now, just so you can kind of look back. But one of the key lines in Shade's letter there was, it's red as the dawn here. That's something mm -hmm. that I forgot all about until I heard you read it, and now having read farther in the books, she does a really good job with, with some foreshadowing and yeah. throwing things in there that hint at things, and you don't catch it until later, and mm -hmm. you remember back, and that's one of those things I didn't even remember. Yeah. So, red as the, it's red as the dawn here. That's something to kind of remember from Shay, her a, brother's letter. Tell us a little bit about the dual complexity of that statement. So... What does Shade actually mean by it's red as the dawn here? He means that there are, you know, nothing but reds. There are so few silvers there that reds are all you can see. So that kind of tells us that this particular 
group of red soldiers, the Silvers don't feel like they need very much supervision. Yes. They're allowing them to move in massive numbers without a lot of Silvers there giving them direction. They don't see them as someone they need to keep an eye on. Right. And that may be a big blind spot that comes back to bite them to a bite bit. them a little bit so some more Correct. foreshadowing <laughs> and then also like i mean it's war so yeah it's bloody there too yes but they're not actually in combat at the point where yeah. he's writing the letter they've retreated from the front lines mm -hmm. um another thing that we learned from the letter is that Bree is coming up on his five-year leave yeah. from conscription, so that's going to put him at almost 23 yeah. as the oldest. So that kind of gives us an anchor point for ages when okay. this starts. Bree is the oldest. He's 23. Giza is the youngest, and she is almost, almost 15. 15. Um, tell us a little bit about, you said he's coming up with a five-year leave, which means he'll get to take a leave. Mm -hmm. But it's not he gets to come home for good, right? Yes. It's, Explain I don't, that a little I don't bit. know how long it is, but it's um, like a week, it's like a week long leave or something like that. Kind of catch up with the family. And then you go right back. And then you go right so back. So it's not like it's a leave as in they're going to be gone for like months or years and then they go back. No, it's like you get to go see your family for a week then you ship right back. Yeah. And, um, after five years, after five years. And I think that's like every five years or something yeah, like that but it just, until you either get too old to be in the army, die or get uh, injured. It's, it's, very it's normal life to them. So they don't point out how, Oh, well, they only get a, f a one week leave after five years. They just mention it as normal because this is what they're used to. But it hits you as the reader, like, geez, these people are, are impressed. He, yeah. He's going off to war for five years to get one week to go see his family. That's, and they've just accepted this. Yeah, that's yeah. just the like, way life is. Like, this is just is. the way their life is. So. Um, and then we get through Shade's letter. What is there something, another event that happens in this chapter? Because these books I noticed, they she really likes, the author likes to have, give you something at the end of each chapter to hook you into reading the next chapter. Yeah. Nothing just ends. All of the chapters yeah. and with a kind of cliffhanger. Almost a mini cliffhanger yeah. or, a, yeah, something that's just like oh, a crap, new revelation. You know. Right. Yeah. So what happens in this chapter? Um, so in this chapter, um, the, I'll kind of set this up, uh, the, during dinner, like right after, they're all basically finished with dinner, uh, the lights go out and... They assume it's just like, you know, ran out of electricity rations, or the box is broken, something like that. This is natural. Their lights go out all the time. Um, and so they were going to go fix it, but everyone is tired, so they're all just like, nah, I'm going to go to bed. Uh, and Mare goes up to the bedroom, the bedroom loft area, where she and Giza are sleeping, and Giza is already asleep. And Mare lays there, just trying to fall asleep. And uh, as she is, she hears a bird call, which she knows is coming from Kalorn. And she's like, she, she doesn't want him to be there. She's tired, she wants to go to bed. She thinks it can wait till morning. And uh, it gets, the next time it's louder. And because she doesn't want to wake Giza, she gets up and goes to see what he wants. Um, he... And then when she gets outside, she realizes that he's been crying, which is something Kalorn does not do. He's not a crier. Uh, he, and sh his knuckles are bleeding. So clearly he's very angry. And uh, when she asks him what's wrong, he tells her that his master fell and died. The, the fisherman that he was an apprentice for. So uh, he hadn't finished his training. Ev all the other fishermen have apprentices so he can't get work and the chapter ends uh with a quote from Kalorn, and it says they're going to send me to the war so that chapter ends with oh no Kalorn's gonna get conscripted in like a week if they can't do something do we know why because his uh 
master, the fisherman he was apprenticing under, fell and that, died. That's right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so, that's leaving us with a little cliffhanger um, already. He, Kalorn is, as we see him in the first two chapters, kind of relaxed almost about everything because he's safe. Yeah. And then, just it like that. It takes one it's, thing. It's not even his fault. His, you know, the, the person that's teaching him how to fish, person that he's working under as an apprentice dies, and that means he's going to the war. And it's... Mm -hmm. It's nothing he can control. Right. So, this is a going to be the first time I think we see Mare's actual talents kind of come into play because it's always been she thinks she's going to go and there's mm -hmm. no way to get around it. But now this is someone that she really cares about. Yeah. Who wasn't going to go... And now he's going to go. Mm -hmm. um, and the first two, I know that later on we get kind of to see this, but do we see really any in the first two chapters of Mayor's kind of um, mother, almost like mother, she's almost like mothering towards Killorn, even though they're friends. She's um, really like... A little bit. Feels like she has to take care of him. Yeah, when you first meet him, they're very, it's, it's a kind of, it's like a, really good friend or almost a brother sister type relationship that you see but even though Kalorn is older Mare is almost like the older sister right. very protective even though she shouldn't be because she's actually uh, about six months younger so we've got the setup after at this point for what's moving forward everything's changed a little bit we kind of get dropped in find out about the Silvers, um, you know, understand what conscription is about the war, mm -hmm. we meet Mayor's family, and then the first real big kind of punch to the gut we're running into is going to be conflict for the protagonist is her best friend is now, has a week before he's going to get shipped off. Mm -hmm. So this is where things kind of veer off and start to to move forward in the, in the uh, book. But I think there's a good point to stop. Mm -hmm. For right now, um, we've got the first two chapters, um, and then next time we can get into the third chapter, I think, and you've got an idea of who the characters are, and we're going to really see some things start to kind of take off and the storyline start to twist a little bit. Yeah. A lot is going to happen in chapter three. It's a, a lot. Very, it's a very, uh, uh, chapter three and chapters three and four are very big. We may it's we may lot. have to devote one entire episode each chapter. We'll see how it goes. Awesome. But... We'll see how it goes. Yeah. All right, good talk. Well, this has been Reading with the Rockefellers, mm -hmm. um, chapters one and two of Red Queen. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. Mm -hmm.